the highest summit of all art and life. Beauty, then, though difficult to capture and not always easy to appreciate, is no mirage appearance evoked by individual desires for a life beyond life. It is no escape, no opium dream, for, though the artist's creation may be appreciated by people of different cultures and countries, it must be founded solidly on realities underlying the surface conditions of life. And so the fundamental question arises, what exactly has art to do with life? The answer is everything and nothing. Nothing in respect of how most of all our lives are spent in what trivialities of intercourse, futilities of action. Yet, if we have experienced something deeper, more permanent, then art has everything to do with life, for it interprets the moments we have lived most intensely. It is emotion recollected in tranquility. And this is why there is no such thing as a combination of forms or sounds or words that bears a significance unrelated to our experience of life. Forms of expression, the servants of impulse. Just as art is inseparable from life, so is the form which any work of art assumes, into which it bodies itself forth through the medium of the artist's individuality, inseparable from the content or what the artist wishes to express. True, there are certain patterns or forms which the critic may classify apart from the subject or content which finds expression through them. There are verse forms, for example, such as the sonnet and blank verse. There are various kinds of musical forms, but the form cannot be superimposed on what the artist wishes to express, and it cannot be deliberately selected by him. However skillfully an artist may make use of any form of expression, with whatever grace he may adapt it to his individual style, still he will not have produced any great and lasting work if, combined with his mastery over technique, he has not made that vital contact with reality, which, as even psychoanalysts have not helped us out here, we must call by that old-fashioned, much-abused term, inspiration. To sum this matter up, style, which is the imprint of the artist's individuality on his work, content, which is what he wishes to express, and form, the shape his work assumes, all merge together in great art. They are one and indivisible. How the artist conveys his message. The Japanese artist who considers the landscape he is about to paint upside down between his legs does not do so because he is afflicted by that imp of the perverse who so often stimulates Bernard Shaw to produce his paradoxes. He does it so that he may more easily contemplate his landscape freed from those everyday associations which are apt to detract from its deeper significance, the meaning which art endeavours to capture. He makes this inverted examination in order, for example, that a tree shall not appear to be merely something growing out of the ground, bearing a certain kind of fruit to which he is particularly partial, and which, despite the best creative will, he is not able completely to disassociate from matters irrelevant to his purpose as an artist. He wishes to contemplate the tree as it blends in with the composition of the landscape, irrespective of other considerations. Examine a Chinese or a Japanese print and you will often find that the artist has not indicated the ground at all. The figures might appear to a matter-of-fact person, one who requires art to represent, not to interpret, to be floating in the air, and such a person would conclude that the only possible meaning was that the figures were meant to be supernatural. Actually, of course, the artist has taken from his subject some of its everyday meaning in order to bring out more clearly the significance he perceives beneath the surface. The only meaning that lies in art. The important point to remark is this. There are not two distinct kinds of meaning in art, an everyday one and a mysterious one which has nothing to do with ordinary life. The truth is that the meaning art catches and interprets may be wholly conveyed through the presentation of associations, 
ideas, images which are familiar to us all every day, but that sometimes also, in some mediums, the artist is able to convey his meaning without making so much use, or without making any use, of these interpreters. This brings us to the differences between the various arts. It is obvious that much music causes pleasure in the hearer purely and simply by the combination and variation of sounds, which, while they play upon chords of emotion, evoke no definite picture in the mind. Music has been called the most abstract of the arts. It would be better to call it the most direct, for it causes that indefinable pleasure which all art conveys with less recourse to everyday meanings than do any of the other arts. Art that may dispense with everyday meaning. A picture also, though less easily, may not convey any idea of what it is a picture of. It may be parts taken from a number of objects, blended into composition. Sculpture provides a good example of both ways of presenting the underlying significance of life. Go into the Grecian Gallery of the British Museum. There you will see the human body idealised in its physical aspect. The Greek sculptors translated the classical conception of life into stone. The human form is intellectualised in their sculpture. The figures convey the ideas of physical fitness, womanly grace, sensual abandon, soldierly vigour. Or, if you examine examples of medieval Christian sculpture, you will see that the artist has draped and shaped his figures to express his belief, a belief which turned away from physical beauty towards spiritual regeneration. Yet, on the other hand, sculpture may also, as much modern work in this medium, express a significance dependent on no concept. It may not look like anyone, and it may not convey any idea evoke any sentiment which may be defined by the beholder. It pleases, but we cannot tell why, except that there is harmony in it, arising from its shape, balance and design, and something which we too have felt. It is clear then that three of the arts, music, painting and sculpture, may capture beauty in nature and communicate it while dispensing with meaning in the everyday sense altogether. What about the other two arts, literature and architecture? The architect's and the poet's message. The writer works with words, and though he may not always use the everyday meaning of words, there is no escape from the associations they evoke in the reader. Even the fantastically compounded words in Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky, "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the borough groves, and the moam wraiths outgrave. Convey a more or less definite image to the mind. They are more than mere sound. In the same way, architecture is more than a tracing out of an abstract pattern in stone or concrete. The architect first considers the uses of the building he is to design. The harmony of the structure is dependent on these uses. The architect perceives the beauty latent in them, and he shapes his material in accordance with these perceptions. A factory that looked like a church would be a sorry structure and vice versa. The architect, besides interpreting the spirit of an age, be it a machine age or a golden age of Athens, is concerned no less with the needs of the age and of the people who are to use the building according as they are to live, work or pray in it. And for this reason, architecture, like literature, is inseparable from everyday meaning. Yet art has not two meanings but one meaning, which may be conveyed either directly to our intuition or indirectly by way of our intellect. Art as a means of escape into life. There are people who say, art is all very well for those who have a taste for it, but we really don't have time to make a study of art. We can get along very well without it. These people have already been answered in what we have said about the relation of art to life, and about the meaning of art. But to emphasise a point which is important, it may be as well to sum up. We must not only bring life to our appreciation of art, but, conversely, bring art to our experience of life. 
This is the function of art. Art is not an escape from life. If we call it an escape at all, it is an escape to life. The test of great art is precisely that it does not lead away from reality. The artist selects, arranges, composes to a design we only vaguely sense, but which nevertheless is present in the artist's material and is responded to, more or less, by us all. As Walter Pater wrote, In truth, all art does but consist in the removal of surplusage from the last finish of the gem engraver blowing away the last particles of invisible dust back to the earliest divination of the finished work to be lying somewhere, according to Michelangelo's fancy, in the rough-hewn block of stone.